Martin's Folly, well, there was an album, there was a self-titled album that I wasn't involved in at all. And then Man It's Cold came about. I had been in and out of the band. I was playing in the band and I left to tour with a, with a blues artist and they started the record with Tony Mamoni. I don't know if right, you know Tony. Yeah. So Tony did the f first half of the record and then I came back from that tour and started doing gigs again with the band and then they invited me to come up and do the second half of the record. So that album, the one you have, Man It's Cold, right. is the first album right. that I'm on. And I stayed with the band. Uh, great just a real real yeah, band yeah. project fun chris gray and, and pat and jim great buddies of mine and i stuck with it and we promoted that record and we started working on material for what was going to be the next record uh from hope mm -hmm. and one of the songs that we were going to um record was it, we were thinking about recording was i wish i was your mother ian hunter's yeah. song and we're at rehearsal and we're thinking well we'll, we'll do this original we'll do that original maybe covers and we played Wish I Was Your Mother and we, man, we really should get this on the record. And somebody said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could get Ian Hunter to, to come in and sing on this with us, you know? And I thought, hmm, you know, I left the rehearsal going, you know, my good buddy Steve Holly has played with Ian for <laughs> a bunch of years. Right, and right. I'm a huge Ian, huge, huge Ian Hunter fan. He was one of the, the main guys and, uh, you know, my influences and uh i I, le I didn't say anything at the at the rehearsal but i thought man maybe there's some way i could make this happen so i called steve up and i said you know we're recording this song and i know you've been doing gigs with ian he's been starting to come out and, and record a little more and, and play a little more you think there would be any way that he would be interested in doing this and steve said let me let me find out then he called us back and the terms were very casual he uh ian wanted uh some Carlsberg beer and a shepherd's pie and a hotel room. So he was going to drive down from, from where he lives, a little north of here. And uh, so the idea is that he would come down and we would have some shepherd's pie and some beer in the studio and he would check into the hotel and uh, he would come in and see what we were, what we were up to. And he, he did. We, we had basic tracks down. Um, I was so bummed out because I, you know, constant freelancing and, uh, you know, a guy that I am, I'm booked on a gig with somebody else the night that he was booked into the wow. studio. So I made a beeline for my gig and came over to, to where they were doing the tracks. And Ian and Steve were there with the Folly guys. And uh, Ian's in the booth and Roscoe's producing them. And, and uh, basically, you know, he sang the reintro of the song. Ian basically came in and, and that was it, like sort of coming out of the curtain, right? Sure. If you're familiar with the song, yeah. the song, the intro, the verse, the chorus has happened, and then there's an intro and it starts all over again. So that was the idea that, that Ian would start singing at the, at the reintro. And sure enough, he showed up and he did it and he seemed to have a good time and, uh, and it was cool. We got Ian Hunter on our on our record, yeah, you know. Our so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was, so it was just a thrill, you know. And that was a few years before I'd ever uh, thought that I'd be playing in his band or anything. It so was you just, got you got into Ian the Rant band through Steve Holly. Through Steve, so yeah. He, but, but Ian knew you already in a sense. Well, we had met on the on the, the through the Folly thing, and uh, so yeah, there was that familiarity. And Steve had been playing with Ian for years, uh, so he was aware of me i think probably from some other projects steve and i <clears throat> have uh, been playing music together for a long time and i've been a lot a lot of band projects and a lot of recording projects so he was aware of a couple of projects that steve and i were involved in and, and when they needed a guy uh graham maybe was there before me yes right yeah. and he did the tracks for the shrunken heads album and they were getting ready to go out and promote that mm -hmm. record and graham was had to go out i it was either Joe Jackson or somebody else that he was that he was committed to at the time. So I really thought I was going into sub mm -hmm. for Graham. Mm -hmm. You know, when when Steve called me and said, "Would you be up for this?" Of course. Yeah. And uh, we went out and did those shows with the with the Zombies. And they said, "Well, why don't you just learn? We're going to go out and do an hour before the Zombies, and just learn these songs and come and do it, and, and we'll see see what goes on from there." And so we went out to California and did the shows, and uh, I thought I did pretty good, and everybody, you know, seemed happy to have me around. And the, the road crew guys started coming up to me, asking me about gear that I would want uh, in Europe mm -hmm. a couple months down the road. But I had yet to yeah. really be hired or invited. I really thought I was being yeah. sort of auditioned. Right. Uh, 
And uh, on the flight back home, I, I don't know if it was Steve or somebody, I said, you know, these guys are asking me about the rider. And, you know, am I doing this gig? So sure, sure enough, word got back to Ian. I'm in a middle seat, you know, sleep <laughs> like this. And I, hey, and I look over and there's Hunter standing in the aisle going, you got the gig, and walks away. I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'm doing the rest of, rest of the tour. And uh, I've been there ever since. Yeah. Uh, that was um, March of 2007. Um, I really thought I was there to, to fill yeah. in for Graham, but, uh, you know, it was a good fit, and Steve and I are great buddies, and... and uh, he said it's his best rhythm, sir. So. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's a dream come true for me. Uh, I mean, forget about professionally. It's, you know, anybody would want to play with Ian Hunter, and he, it's a great, he's a great singer-songwriter and great uh, catalog of, of music, and, uh, but, you know, the personal thing of being the fan that, right. it's a dream come true and then the you on your wall. then you add the comfort level you come into a situation like that again without an audition similar to the kale thing it was just a word of mouth steve said this is the guy and ian asked around he asked graham and he asked andy york and they were like oh yeah paul sure that's fine so i really went out and did it i did one rehearsal i think and then did those three gigs and and the next thing you know i'm there and it's 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 almost nine years later but uh, um the comfort level with Steve, me growing up with this music, really just, I, I just, I envision what I do as accompanying singer-songwriters. It's, it's always what I've done, and a lot of what I've done in New York in between the oldies yeah. concerts is accompanying singer-songwriters on their showcases, and, and it's a role that I'm comfortable in. And guys like John Cale or Dion, Ian Hunter, they're rock stars and they're household names to a certain degree, but really, they're singer-songwriters. They're guys that are using this medium, the acoustic guitar, the piano. They sit on the edge of the couch and they moan out whatever's on their mind and they use that three-chord rock song. Whether it's an anthem or an introspective mm -hmm. ballad, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that we grew up, the music that we like from the 70s, it's a singer-songwriter. And that's where I feel I, I, that's what I, I'm comfortable. That's my comfort zone. Whether I'm playing rock and roll all night and party every day to the tennis racket <laughs> in my bedroom or whether I'm playing Abraham Martin and John yeah. real quietly with Dion while we're all sitting on stools that's that's what it is for me mm -hmm. is getting whether I'm subdividing 16th notes or playing staccato or legato or all the the tools that we need to do as bass players I, that stuff really goes out the window once yeah. once you go on stage right you're playing with Ian Hunter and he's doing Irene Wilde and you just I always tell singer songwriters when they're apologizing to me maybe they made a mistake I'm like I'll follow you off the edge of a cliff. <laughs> Many nights you do. Wow. I think... I think the first Hunter album... Um, that Man Overboard? Man Overboard, I think. I'm happy with the way the bass sounds. Right, you always you bass player, right? You go, you, you always hear the, the mistake that you should have punched in, or you think, man, I would, you know, with b getting basic tracks, it's always about getting the drum sound, and then the guitars come in, and so the bass always seems to be the afterthought, and you go, man, I wish we'd spent more time working on the bass sound, and that's when I listen back, you, you, you know, you don't think about all the good stuff you played. You think, man, there's that, there's that F sharp. I really probably should have played the, the root on that. Or, yeah, or again, the tone. But there's a record that, again, the sentimental thing, I'm playing with Ian Hunter. I got to be part of the process of him writing a record and contributing parts to it. They, they dialed up a great sound. Yeah. Uh, Andy York, producer, and, and, um, and Pete Moshe, the engineer, just dialed up a hell of a sound. It's, not a, it, it's, it's a singer-songwriter album. It's a quieter record, yeah. and so the bass really pops out. So I get to hear myself really good, you know, and it's and I'm not embarrassed by it like sometimes you are. So very proud of very proud of that.